Welcome. Uh, my name's Associate Professor John Eden. I'm a director here at Wirria, and I'm a reproductive endocrinologist, which basically means I'm a gynaecologist who specialises in hormones. Today I'm going to talk about menopause. And when I was thinking about this topic, I actually thought it'd be better to talk about breast cancer and menopause. I'm not sure if you knew this or not, but 400,000 Australian women are having a really bad time going through menopause. Some women have five to 10 flushes an hour, day and night, and less than one in eight get any treatment at all. And the most popular treatment amongst doctors is actually an antidepressant, not hormone therapy. Why is this? Why are so many women being distressed by severe menopause and yet they're not taking our best treatment? Well, of course, the reason is they're scared they're gonna get breast cancer. So let's look at the whole issue of hormones and breast cancer. The first thing I want to tell you that you may be a little bit surprised about is that actually the death rate from breast cancer, actually most cancers in Australia, have been falling steadily for the last 30 years. Three quarters of all breast cancers are mammogram detected, often very small three, four millimeter cancers, which have a 20 year survival of over 90%. Most early stage breast cancer has a five year survival approaching 100%. And yet surveys have shown that the average Australian woman is terrified she's gonna die of breast cancer. Last year I was talking to a, a reporter who thought that 40% of Australian women died of breast cancer. The real figure is 4%. So it's clear to me there's a lot of, well, confusion, ignorance and mythology around the whole story of breast cancer. So let's have a look at it. I've had a 30 year research interest in breast cancer and over the last 30 years I've seen thousands of women who've had breast cancer. They come to see me to, to uh, fix their hot flushes, vaginal dryness and other menopausal symptoms. Um, most of them thought they just got breast cancer one day and are actually quite surprised to learn that it takes decades and decades to actually develop breast cancer. I often use the analogy of, of diabetes. You don't just get diabetes. The seeds are sown often early in life, and then depending on genetic and environmental factors, it takes decades and decades and decades to get diabetes. Well, it turns out that most cancers are the same. For example, if you look at risk factors for breast cancer, uh, some of them are quite surprising. We know that diet does have a role uh, in breast cancer, um, but its effect is actually most great in the first 20 years of life, where its effect is actually very strong. Uh, whereas studies done in people over the age of 60 have shown that changing diet towards a more vegan lifestyle, for example, has no effect on breast cancer risk. So why would it be that changing uh, a diet, say for example, high in uh, vegetable matter or a traditional Japanese diet has a powerful effect at reducing the risk of breast cancer uh, if one consumes that as a child and as a young adult, and yet it has almost no effect in adult life? Well, it actually comes down to stem cells. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of stem cells. Stem cells are very popular at the moment uh, that have the potential to repair the brain, to grow a new kidney and fantastic stuff. It turns out that most cancers and probably most breast cancers actually start in the stem cells. And so what happens with diet early on, uh, having a, a good diet high in vegetable material, perhaps even being vegan uh, or a traditional Japanese diet, it actually, actually programs the stem cells in the breast to be less vulnerable to turning into malignant cells. Another strange fact that a lot of people aren't aware of is early first pregnancy has a profoundly um, protective effect on uh, future risk of breast cancer. Uh, my mother had me at 19, for example, which it wasn't unusual for her generation, and her risk of breast cancer is reduced to one third off normal because she had her first child at the age of 19. Uh, we know that if a woman has a first baby uh, at the age of 25, it halves her risk of breast cancer in later life, and by 30, uh, there's no longer a beneficial effect of first pregnancy. Well, why would having your first child at 19 or 20 or 25 markedly reduce your risk of breast cancer? Well, again, uh, the pregnancy hormones do some very positive things to these uh, stem cells in the breast and make them less able to become malignant. And the earlier you do that, the lower your risk of getting breast cancer for the rest of your life. So as you, I hope you're getting a picture now that you, you, know, you don't just suddenly get breast cancer. Uh, you may pick it up on a mammogram that wasn't there two years ago, but in fact the disease has been slowly evolving over decades and decades and decades. 
Um, you may be surprised to learn that, um, for example, when a, the very first cell that becomes malignant um, uh, starts to slowly grow, it takes seven years on average for that to grow big enough to be detected on a mammogram, which is about three or four millimetres. So first cell to three millimetre size takes seven years. And it takes another seven years to be big enough to find a lump in your breast. So the woman who you know, self-examines and finds a lump in her breast has actually had basically cancer there for 10 or 15 years. Now I'm not saying that to alarm you. <laughs> I'm saying that to, to get a, you give you a feel of this is a very slowly progressive thing. The other thing that's fascinating is that these malignant stem cells in the breast actually don't have hormone receptors. I'll say that again. The stem cells in the breast that actually become malignant are not sensitive to estrogen or progesterone. Now, as they evolve, they produce other cells that can become sensitive to estrogen and progesterone, but not the very first malignant stem cell. What's the significance of that? Well, most people who have been researching um, uh, what causes breast cancer uh, basically believe that hormones have very little to do with actually getting breast cancer. Where they may have a role is how fast the cancer grows. But to suggest, for example, that, well, a woman took the pill and that gave her breast cancer, or a woman took hormone therapy for 10 years and that gave her breast cancer, isn't actually a, a, a true statement. She actually had a small breast cancer in her breast, and it's possible that perhaps the hormones made it grow a little faster. Uh, but they certainly didn't give her the disease in the first place. And that's a completely different story to what women are told out in the community. Now, in terms of the older woman, say a woman over 50 who's going through her menopause, you know, what, what's the relevance of all this? Um, well, a couple of, couple of the basic facts. Uh, first of all, breast cancer is 10 times more common at 70 than it is at 40. All right, so it's not something that just happens to women at 50. Actually, of course, most cancer gets more common as you get older, unfortunately. It's true for breast cancer, prostate cancer and others. About the only one that goes down with age is actually cervical cancer. And of course, with modern uh, cervical screening tests and the immunisation we have now, we're hoping to eradicate cervical cancer over the next 20 years. But getting back to the breast cancer story, um, the woman around 50, 55 who's having severe menopausal symptoms, who, who's too scared to take hormone therapy, well, what actually is the impact of different hormone treatments on her uh, risk of actually getting a breast cancer, if you want to use that language? Well, the first thing is um, the urban myth that I hear every day in my workplace is all hormones cause uh, breast cancer. Well, as I've just said earlier, that's not true. Uh, it's true that some hormonal therapies might make the cancer appear a little sooner than others, but you may be surprised to learn that there actually are some hormone treatments that slow the growth, growth of cancer cells. Uh, for example, some of you may have heard of a drug called tamoxifen. It's a treatment for breast cancer. Well, we have a spin-off drug from that called Evista or Riloxifene that we use to treat osteoporosis, and that markedly reduces the risk of getting an estrogen-sensitive breast cancer. Another commonly prescribed hormone treatment called Livial or Tibolone, very popular amongst my GP colleagues. It's a very useful drug for women with mild to moderate uh, symptoms and um, they don't get periods and they don't get breast pain. So it's a very easy drug to prescribe. And a lot of my patients are surprised to learn that if you take Livial for a few years, it actually lowers your risk of breast cancer. There was a big study called the LIFT study, as in L-I-F-T, uh, women average age, uh, women uh, aged between 60 and 80, uh, it was an osteoporosis study. But one of the side uh, uh, effects of taking Livial in this age group was they had a significantly lower risk of getting breast cancer. Um, so I hope you can see that they're not all the same. Now, the, the, stu the study that scared the world was called Women's Health Initiative, and I haven't got time to go into that great detail, but it's fair to say the study was markedly flawed and it used a regimen that basically nobody uses anymore. The Americans seem to have a love affair with a strange estrogen called Premarin. If you haven't heard of Premarin before, you're gonna be shocked when I tell you what it is, but it, I'm not joking, it's actually pregnant mare's urine. I'll say that again, pregnant mare's urine. We're talking pregnant horses tied in, in stables with catheters in. Uh, it's 1942 technology. Uh, in my opinion, it has no place in modern medicine, but for some reason the Americans have a love affair with this strange estrogen. And uh, in this study, uh, Women's Health Initiative, they gave a um, Premarin with um, a synthetic progesterone called Provera. 
Now, putting aside the morality, which for me is the end of the product, but just put that aside for a second. Uh, it was given to women average age 64, and when they were designing this study in the 90s, um, uh, those of us who were around discussing it at the time, and I was certainly around and one of them discussing it, were really surprised that the Americans would give this to women that age. We weren't worried about breast cancer, we were worried about clotting. If you give women average age 64, which means some of them were in their 80s, um, you, we, we knew you were going to cause clot in the leg, clot in the lung and stroke, because when you take a, a, an oestrogen, especially a synthetic oestrogen, orally, the liver gets the entire dose, that's where the clotting factors are made, and like everything, it gets worse as you got older. Um, I can remember some European colleagues pleading with the Americans to use an oestrogen patch, which was available at the time, which would have negated the clot issue. They didn't do it. They could have used natural progesterone instead of Provera. They didn't do that either, and they went ahead and did their study. Now, what surprised us all on the 10th of July 2002, a day I'll never forget, the worst day of my life, uh, the principal researcher who by the way, was a statistician, not a medical doctor, went to the world media using catastrophic language, stop your HRT, massive increased risk of breast cancer, and basically terrified the women of the world. Um, I was actually quite puzzled because the actual increased risk was eight per 10,000 women. Yes, eight per 10,000 women, and it wasn't statistically significant. And the guy's a professional statistician. So we all smelled a rat, it took 10 years for him to finally admit that he actually did it deliberately because he hated American drug companies. What do I say? <laughs> Terrible. And in doing so, he's damaged a whole generation of women. Now, in contrast to that story, the Europeans led by the French um, have never really used Premarin. And in fact, the French in particular have popularized the use of what I call body identical hormones, which are the natural hormones. For those who are interested, on our website we have a download uh, under patient, the patient download section called Body Identical Hormones, you can read all that. But we have estradiol, which is the natural human estrogen. Uh, it's made from plant sources. Uh, it's made in the laboratory, but it's a green product. Uh, we have progesterone, real life progesterone. Uh, we have estradiol available as tablets, gels and patches. Uh, the little progesterone cap that we have, uh, very French, because you can actually use it orally, vaginally, or even rectally, would you believe? Yes, I know it's very un-Australian, but it's very popular in Europe. Uh, and these natural hormones, um, especially if, it's, say, a gel or a patch is used with natural progesterone, there's no effect on the clotting system, no effect on the risk of clot in the leg, clot in the lung, or stroke, and it has about half the risk of breast cancer compared with the synthetics. In fact, a review uh, published three years ago by Professor Assey from the Mayo Clinic um, uh, concluded that the, uh, if there was an increased risk of breast cancer with uh, uh, estradiol and progesterone, it was so low as getting hard to measure, certainly below 4 per 10,000. So, um, a, a, a poor woman, let's say she's 52, having five flushes an hour, day and night, waking every 30 minutes, uh, hasn't slept properly for the last five years. Uh, yes, I see three or four of these patients you know, every couple of days. Um, um, you know, too scared to take hormone therapy. Um, it's terrible, uh, and she should be on hormone therapy, uh, and it's perfectly safe if, uh, if it's done properly. Uh, there may be a role for using something like, like Livial, uh, although a lot of women do like the idea of using natural hormones, and we do have all the natural hormones now, as I mentioned. Um, I should also mention in passing, uh, there is another type of hormone therapy called bioidentical. Um, I, I think there's, there's that, that's for another day perhaps, but uh, a lot of women are unaware that so-called bioidentical hormones are not tested. Uh, they're not uh, tested um, under the regulations of the, the, the TGA. Um, and in fact, uh, in my opinion, they're largely unnecessary because we actually do have the tested natural hormones. Um, so if someone's trying to push you towards handmade compounded bioidentical hormones, I would strongly recommend you read my download on body identical hormones, which are natural hormones, but have been tested. One special case is the woman who has a strong family history of breast cancer. Uh, it's difficult to give the full story in a few minutes, but um, the good news is we actually do have a lot of ways of helping these women too. Um, broadly speaking, if a woman has more than, say, three family members who've had breast, or especially if there's a couple of ovarian cases, cancer cases in the family history as well. 
uh, they can be referred to a genetic cancer clinic. And, and these, uh, these colleagues are, are very, very helpful. Um, each major hospital will have uh, these people and I would strongly recommend if you do have a strong family history of breast cancer, get your GP to refer you to a genetic cancer clinic for evaluation. I haven't got time to talk a lot about women who've had breast cancer, but let me just point out too on our website, we do have a download for managing menopause after breast cancer. And I do want to stress that the many of the women who have had breast cancer, we do have effective treatments for their hot flushes too. Um, uh, I'm sure you're all aware, well aware that often in medicine we have a drug that's invented for this purpose then we find it's good for something else. Uh, we have four or five drugs. Uh, uh, for example, I'll mention one, it's, uh, it's called um, uh, oxybutynin. Uh, it's actually used to treat bladder urgency. You know, some women have run to the toilet a lot, it's a very effective drug for that. Would you believe low doses of oxybutynin can be very helpful for hot flushes. So, um, we also have treatments to help vaginal dryness in women who've had breast cancer as well that are safe and won't interfere with their treatments. Uh, I do know there are thousands and thousands of women who've had oestrogen sensitive cancers in the past and think there's no treatment they can have and that's not true either. And uh, you'll get a lot of information at our website if you look at that, again, that section called Managing Menopause After Breast Cancer. Uh, a lot of the medicines I mentioned there your GP can prescribe and are not contraindicated uh, for your cancer treatment. Uh, let me spend a few moments talking a bit more about vaginal dryness after an oestrogen sensitive breast cancer. Uh, this is a very difficult problem. Um, a woman who's had an oestrogen sensitive breast cancer, broadly speaking, uh, my oncology colleagues don't like them having vaginal oestrogens, and, uh, which are very, very effective for treating menopausal um, dryness. Um, some women will respond to simple measures such as avoiding soap, because soap uh, dries the skin. It never fails to amaze me how many um, Aussie women know not to put soap on their face because it dries their skin, but then you know, wash their vulva and their bottom with a bar of soap. Uh, don't do it. <laughs> Much better to use a soap-free wash, a Cetaphil, QV, something like that. And uh, don't be afraid to use a, a dermatological grade moisturiser on the vulval skin too. You can use something like QV Intensive Care uh, quite safely on the vulval skin. Uh, lubricants can be very effective. Um, our physio Sharon loves olive oil. Uh, olive oil works really well, but it's a bit messy. Um, there's a product called Silk with a Y, S-Y-L-K. It's made in New Zealand. It's based on uh, natural products and it's a fantastic lubricant. And for a lot of women, that'll make sex comfortable. However, we're left with a significant minority where it's just not enough and uh, intercourse can be impossible. Um, we actually do have some data using the so-called CO2 laser. It may, that may sound a little strange, ladies, but we don't actually laser the vagina like burn it or anything like that. It's a, it's a special probe that's put into the vagina and one on the vulva. And it actually, uh, it's a dermatological laser uh, designed originally, I think, for the face, actually, where to help thicken skin with wrinkles and things like that. Um, but there are now quite a few studies showing this to be quite effective for a lot of women. Uh, especially where they can't use estrogen. And the laser actually encourages um, a thickening of the skin and, and an improvement of lubrication. And, that's, and it's often effective. Uh, having said that, we're often left with a, a small minority where nothing works except estrogen. And I haven't got time to go into great detail, but we often uh, use compounding chemists and actually compound what I call ultra low dose topical estrogens. And then we do blood tests uh, to show that it's not absorbed and uh, my oncology colleagues are happy and these, these treatments are very, very effective. So the take home message is vaginal dryness is a big problem, very, very big problem. By the age of 60, it's almost universal. The average woman's gonna use vaginal estrogens very successfully, but if you had an ER positive breast cancer, you're safer to use uh, soap free washes, plain moisturizers, lubricants such as olive oil or sink, uh, or silk, I should say. Um, but if you're not winning, maybe CO2 laser, and if all else fails, ultra low dose topical estrogen backed up with some blood tests to make sure it's not being absorbed. So, to conclude, uh, menopause can be managed, and it can be managed safely without substantially increasing the risk of breast cancer. Uh, we do have a lot of information on our website, and I'd encourage you to have a read of that. Uh, but start by seeing your GP. A lot of the treatments we talk about on the website, uh, you don't have to see a specialist, they can be prescribed by your GP. 
It is important to have your checkups too. Um, mammograms do save lives. Don't forget to have a mammogram every two years. Uh, we think it's a good idea too to have a bone density every couple of years. Obviously do the test the GP wants you to have done, you know, annual blood test, check your cholesterol, uh, cervical screening test every five years. Uh, all these tests really do save lives. Again, uh, perhaps a good way of finishing this little uh, podcast is to remind you that uh, breast cancer, the, the good news is the death rate from breast cancer is falling steadily and has fallen substantially over the last 30 years. It's largely due to two major factors. One is early diagnosis with mammography. That's been a revolution. Three quarters of, of breast cancers are now mammogram detected. Tiny little things that you'd never find and often quite simple treatments that don't have a lot of side effects and the women are often cured. So it's a great story, not a, not a scary story. It's a good news story. But even the women with advanced cancers, we have fantastic treatments these days. Um, just a week or two ago, I was talking to one of my oncology colleagues and he was telling me about a case of a patient who had a very late stage breast cancer and he'd been palliating her for 12 years. I mean, just, <laughs> I find that remarkable. So, you know, uh, in 30 years ago, she would have died within three months. And here she is alive and well with low dose, of some sort of low, I won't go into the details, some low dose treatment. And she's alive and well 12 years later with stage four cancer. Uh, now that's not to deny that uh, women do die of breast cancer as, you know, men die of prostate cancer too. Um, but the, the good news story is that the, the, the figures really are improving. And taking hormone therapy for, you know, certainly for under five years really makes no difference to your breast cancer risk. We do have effective treatments and go and see your GP and have a talk about them.